this unit, the rubber meets the road. We're going to take everything we've learned, how to manipulate equations to solve them for the unknown, how to translate things that appear in text into equations, and apply them to word problems. But let's review a little bit before we go into that. Remember that when you do a word problem, the first thing you need to do is look carefully at the words and then ultimately get some kind of an equation. And then once you have that equation, then, you're, then no matter how complicated the equation is, you're at the easy part. Because once you have an equation, as long as you follow the steps and follow the rules, you'll know that you're going to come out with an answer. The hard part is to take the words and translate those into the equations. Just Let's look at our dictionary again. For addition, we have x plus 3, 3 added to x, 3 more than x, the sum of x and 3, and x increased by 3. What about subtraction? Directly, it's x minus 3. 3 less than x, 3 subtracted from x. x decreased by 3, and the difference, a magic word for subtraction, between x and 3. And you need to remember, you can't swap that around. It's got to be as read. For multiplication, 3 times x, 3 times a quantity, 3 times a number, 3 times something. x multiplied by 3. The product, the magic word for what you do when you get a multiplication, of x and 3. And we have some additional expressions we can use with multiplication, double, triple, quadruple. It's about as far as we go. The equal sign, mean, you can tr that translates, if you see an equals, that translates to the equal sign. The same as, is, etc. Parentheses, multiplied by, and then it gives you a bunch of other stuff that you're multiplied by. For example, in this case, we could have 5 multiplied by s plus 3, 5 multiplied by s increased by 3, 5 multiplied by s and 3, etc., etc. You get my point. Or we can also say 5 times the quantity. And whenever you hear or see when you're reading the magic word quantity, brackets should spring up around your head because that's tr they're trying to tell you that they want you to group something and then you just have to read uh, your paper or your book to find out what it is they want you to group. So our procedure f um, for solving the equations, again, to review a little bit, we want to simplify both sides of the equations use the distribution law to clear away any parentheses, and then combine like terms. So that's all the basis we need to do. Um, you know, moving the variables to the other side of the equation, uh, using the correct addition-subtraction principle, and so forth, are the things that you need to do. Those are all the procedures. But you can take all of those and until you practice doing a lot of problems, I said this in Unit C, and I guess I'm saying it again now, practicing is very important because you could have all of these procedures and ideas and translations memorized, but where you really get to be able to do math is when you practice and start doing problems. Let's look at a problem. The sum of Dan's age, whoop, that might be me, and Andy's age is 112 years. Andy is four years younger than Dan. We want to know Dan's age and Andy's age. You notice we have two different quantities here. We have Dan and Andy. So we're going to have to manipulate and work back and forth between those two different things. But now let's go information mining what information are we given, and what are we looking for? What we're given is that the sum of the two men's age is 112 years. 
and that Andy is four years younger than Dan. And what we're asked, what are the ages of the two men? Let's see what we're given. Uh, Dan plus Andy is 112, and Andy is four years younger than Dan. And what we want to know is Dan's age and Andy's age. Now, notice I've represented these graphically, and I also know from what I was given in the book, again, representing it graphically, is that that difference between their ages is four years, with Andy being younger. So his age would be less than Dan's. Now, let's see what I could get together as an analysis of this. If we let Dan's age equal D, then since Andy is four years younger, you would expect that something would be taken away because it would be less. Andy's age is D minus 4. Let's try to analyze this and decide how to proceed. We need to write the equation, and you've seen we've already done it, expressing Andy's age as four years less than my age. And then we need to solve this for whatever, once uh, Andy's age, in terms of my age. Then we have the sum of the two ages. So we can take Andy's age and put into it uh, what we got for it in terms of my age, my age minus four, and then we'll have an equation that we can solve. So that's, in words, what our strategy is going to be for coming up with a solution. Let's actually take a look and see how we would work this out. We need to solve for both ages, but if we know one, uh, if you know my age, then Andy's age is just four years less, so it'll be easy. Let's see how we would go about working on this. Here is my age, D, Andy's age, D minus four, and there's the difference, of course. Now, one of the things we're given is that the sum of both of our ages is 112. We know that my age is D, and Andy's is in terms given with respect to my age. It's D minus 4. You see, if we just put another variable in, if we only said Dan's age D plus Andy's age A equals 112, D plus A equals 112, but if you have two unknowns, you can't solve for it. You don't have enough information. So we need to get the equation with only one variable, which is why we need to use Andy's age as d minus 4. Let's write that now as an equation. So we have d, my age, plus d minus 4, Andy's age, is equal to 112. Whew. Well, here we are. We've gotten more than halfway because we've taken that word paragraph, and now we have an equation, and we know we can solve the equation. Here we go. Since it doesn't matter, I don't have anything multiplying Andy's age, the d minus 4 in parentheses, I know that the order I add things doesn't matter, so I can just simplify that, and I have d plus d minus 4. d plus d is 2d, so I have the equation a little bit simplified. 2d minus 4 is equal to 112. We continue with the solution of the equation. 2d minus 4 equals 112. What do you suspect I ought to do next? What I need to do is add 4 to both sides of the equation to get 2d by itself. When I do this, I get 2d is equal to 116. Now to get 1d, I divide both sides by 2, and I've solved for Dan's age. d is equal to 58 years. Notice also that when I have finished solving the equation, I put the units in. All along, we were talking about years, and when I report my answer, I need to report the answer as years because that was part of the original specification of the problem. We have Dan's age. What about Andy's age? Andy's age is 4 less d minus 4, so his age is 54 years. 
Let's check this. We know Dan's age plus Andy's age is equal to 112. 58 plus 54, 8 plus 4 is 12, 5 plus 5 is 10. I believe that's correct. So 112 equals 112. Yes, I've done this problem correctly. Let's take a closer look at the analysis because you're going to see other problems like this. What you've given, what has been given to you here is a couple of different bits of information, actually, and you need to take those two different bits of information and merge them together. You're given two different relationships that you mush together in a way. Let's look at it. For Dan and Andy, the problem gave us two distinct relationships that we had to combine to solve the problem. The first relationship gave me the sum of their two ages. Dan's age, D, plus Andy's age, I'll call it A for now, is equal to 112. And the second relationship I'm given is that Andy is four years younger than Dan, or Dan's four years older, but I can express Andy's age as Dan's age minus four. If I have either of these two by themselves, I can't solve for it because there are too many unknowns. There are two unknowns and not enough information in either one. But given the two relationships, I can substitute Andy's age in terms of my age. So Dan plus Andy equals 112, but Andy is uh, four younger than Dan, so for A, I can put in D minus four. So I've used both pieces of information to make an equation with only one unknown that we can go ahead and solve, 2D minus four equals 112, et cetera, et cetera. We've done this before. I just wanted to point out and make very clear that we had a problem that gave two different relationships. We used one to substitute into the other one, so we had one equation in one unknown. Let's look at another problem that does the same sort of thing. A classroom contains an equal number of men and women. A study group consisting of eight women left to work on their own. This left twice as many men as women in the class, and we would like to know what was the original size of the class. Let's look for the information in here. We see that the class contains an equal number of men and women. Then eight women left. Eight women were gone, and that left twice as many men as women and we wanted to know the original size of the class. Let's look at the information we're given and see what we can do with it. What are we given? We're given, initially, there's an equal number of men and women. M, men, equals women, W, equal. Eight women leave. That's W minus eight because eight go away. And then the result is we have twice as many men as women. And so the number of men is going to be equal to twice and eight minus the original number of women. And the question is, what's the size of the class? Here's the original class, men and women in equal. Then what happens? Eight women leave. And so the number of men stay the same, but they become twice as populous. There are twice as many of them there as the number of women. Let's try to analyze what we've got here. What do we do? We write an equation relating the number of men and women at the beginning. Men equals women, very straightforward. Then we write an equation relating the number of men and women after the eight women leave, twice as many men as women. Then we substitute the number of women who were there at first for the number of men who were there at first into the second equation so that we have an equation purely in one unknown. 
then we solve for the number of women who were there initially, and then from that we know they're, they're equal as far as this problem is concerned, we can get the number of men who were there initially. So this is the strategy I'm going to use to solve this problem. Here we go. At first, we know the number of men is equal to the number of women. And remember now, the men stay in the class all the time. No one goes on a, a little excursion like those eight women. But afterwards, the number of women goes down by eight, and we know that there are twice as many men than women, and the way you say that is the number of men is equal to two times the number of women, twice as many men as women. So I have the equation men is equal to 2w minus 8. But I know that initially the number of men is equal to the number of women. And so I can substitute w in for the word men. And this gives me an equation I can actually solve. The number of women is equal to twice the number of women minus 8. Doing that, I get 2w minus 16 and I can use, solve the equation, w is equal to 2w minus 16. Let me take a w away from both sides, and that gives me 0 is equal to w minus 16. Now I can add 16 to both sides of that and get that the original number of women was 16. The class had 16 women in it. The number of women is 16. The original number of men equaled the number of women, so I, my original class, very nice class size as a teacher, had 16 men, 16 women, and the total number of people in the class, or students, is 32. I finished the problem. I can check this, and I know that before and after, I had to have the same number as men and women, and I got 16. And when 8 left afterwards, is the number of men twice the number of women? Yes, it is. Therefore, the equation is satisfied, and um, the conditions are satisfied, and we can be pretty sure that we solve this word problem correctly. Let's recap a little bit about the general strategy for this, and then we'll go look at that strategy in terms of the next problem. We look for relationships, and typically you have two things related to each other, and we're given what the relationship is, and typically you're given two different relationships. Then you can take one, manipulate it a little algebraically, put it into the second, and solve the equation. Let's see how that works with this next problem. A rectangular chalkboard is three times as long as it is high. There's a relationship. If the length were decreased by three feet and the height increased by three feet, the chalkboard would be square. In other words, the sides would be equal. What are the original dimensions of the chalkboard? Let's see what we're given and what's asked for we see that the chalkboard is three times as long as it is high. One relationship. If the length is decreased by three feet, the height increased by three feet, we have a square, and we're looking for the original dimensions. Let's summarize the information. We're given that our board is three times longer than high, and we would express this with the relationship that its length is three times its height. That would be a reasonable representation of the chalkboard. There's the height. There's the length. And we see that we can represent that same length as three times the height. We're given that information. We see that if the length is decreased by three feet, we take three feet off the length of it, just wiped it off there, and the height is increased by three feet, h plus three, we go three higher on the height, we would have a square. 
So we have 3h, the original length, minus 3, decreased by 3 feet, and the height is given by um, the h, the new height is h plus 3. We know that all the sides are equal, and from this we need to get the original dimensions. So since the sides are equal, we could take the new geometric figure and say that the 3h minus 3 must be equal to the h plus 3 that I get if I look at the new height. A square has all the sides equal, and now I can make the assertion that the length shortened by 3 is equal to the height plus 3. The length is the same as 3 times the height. This is where I've used that first relationship. Now I have an equation that's purely in terms of the height h, and I can solve this equation. I can start by adding a 3 to both sides, giving me that 3 times the height is equal to the height plus 6. Next, what do you guess my next step would be? I subtract h from each side, and I find out that twice the height is equal to 6. If twice the height is equal to 6, then dividing both sides by 2, I get that the height is equal to 3 feet. That's the first most important piece of information. Then I know that 3 times the height is the length, that's 9 feet, so the height is 3 feet, the width or the length is 9 feet, and I can check. If I subtract, I know that if I subtract 3 from the width or the length and add 3 to the height, I get a square. Let's see if that works to check myself. If I know that the height is 3 feet, so 3 times 3 feet minus 3 must be equal to the height plus 3, 3 plus 3. Let's see if that works. 9 minus 3 is 6. 6 is equal to 6, and I'm home free. The thing checks. Let's look at one more problem. On a Math 86 test, I had seven times as many correct answers as incorrect. Well, let's hope so. And there were 120 items on the test. Sounds like a final. And the question is, how many did I get right? Let's look for the information. Here's the first piece of information. Seven times as many correct as incorrect. And the total, incorrect plus correct, was 120. The question is, how many did I get right? Well, let's see what we're given. We're given that the number right was seven times the number wrong. Or right is equal to, is equal to seven wrongs. Gee, did they say two wrongs don't make a right? <laughs> In this case, the right is equal to seven wrongs. And the total of right and wrong was 120. So I have two facts. And what I'd like to know, how many did I get right? In other words, I'm looking for W. And I know now the number right plus the number wrong is 120. So let's let W be the number wrong. And so the number right is seven times the number wrong. I have right plus wrong equals 120. But right is 7w. So I have 7w plus w is equal to 120. Or I have 8 times the number wrong is equal to 120. Now I can solve that equation. If I divide both sides by 8, I get that the number wrong is equal to 15. Then I know that the number right have to be 120 minus the number wrong. So I can do that math. This I would have 105 correct. I've solved the problem. I got 15 wrong out of the 120 and 105 of them right.
probably did pretty well on that. Let's check it. The number right plus the number wrong must equal to 120. 105 plus 15, okay, that's 120. And the number right needs to be seven times the number wrong. Is 105 in fact equal to seven times 15? Yes, it is. It, both facts that I used to establish the answer checked out correctly. So I am pretty sure that I did this problem the best way I could. In this last problem, I'm going to help you to set it up, but then once we have the equation, I'm going to leave it to you to solve the equation. Here's the problem. My father is four times as old as I am now. In 20 years, he'll be twice as old as I will be. What I'd like to know is how old is dad and how old am I? Let's look for the information. My father is four times as old as I am now, is implied, and in 20 years, he'll be twice as old as I will be. And I'd like to know dad's age now and my age now. Let's summarize the information. What are we given? We're given dad's present age is four times my age, and in 20 years, dad will be twice my age. Think about that. Maybe in 80 years, how close will you be to dad's age? <laughs> dad's age now, we'd like to know, and my age now. Let's let my current age be A. Me. Dad is four times my age. That's 4A. In 20 years, I'll be A plus 20 years old. And since dad's current age is 4A, in 20 years, he'll be 4A, his, present, his age now, plus 20 years. What do we have? In 20 years, dad is twice my age. Um, dad's age in 20 years will be 4A plus 20. Twice my age in 20 years will be 2 times the quantity my age in 20 years, which is my age now A plus 20. Here's the equation. Now all you have to do is solve this equation. This is twice my age in 20 years, and this is dad's age in 20 years. Hi everyone, welcome to class 6, unit A of Pre-Algebra Math 86. In this class, we're going to take a close look at equations. Well, I know that we've been doing a lot with equations up to this point, but we're going to start with sort of a review in unit A, and then look formally in the next uh, unit B, C, and D at how you analyze and solve equations. Let's get started with unit A. When you finish the work associated with this unit, here are some of the things you'll be able to do. You'll be able to distinguish between expressions and equations. And I know we've already looked at that, and as I suggested before, unit A is going to be something of a review. We're going to find solutions to equations by, amazingly enough, trial and error. And it's absolutely true that mathematicians still use trial and error to solve pretty complex equations. We'll talk more about it. We're going to distinguish between linear equations and nonlinear ones, and we'll be using the linear ones, and we're going to apply the concept of a balance as a general method for solving equations. Let's get started with 
terminology and ideas about describing equations. Some of this will be a little bit of review. We're going to use the idea of a balance a lot, just as we have been in the previous classes. But we're going to try to look at it in a very formal way this time. If you remember, expressions are mathematical relationships that don't have an equal sign. They're just some sort of, in a way, formula for getting something, for example, this is a recipe for finding the Fahrenheit temperature in terms of the Celsius temperature. But there's no equal sign. It's not asserted that this is the same as something else. On the other hand, here's Einstein's formula relating mass and energy. And you can see this is an assertion. It says that the amount of energy is equal to the object's mass times the square of the speed of light. It's an assertion. It forces the idea that whatever you have on one side is exactly matched by some quantity on the other side. And for algebra or science, not only must the numbers ultimately match, but the units of the numbers also must match for the for you to have a true equal. Just to review again, let's look at a quick quiz where you tell me whether the uh, s s string of symbols that pops up is an equation or an expression. And you remember the criteria. x plus 3, equation or expression? That's an expression. 3x squared plus 4 equals 8. That's an equation because there's an equal sign in it. 5x squared is equal to 2x plus 3. An equation. And finally, x plus y. That's an expression. Since we're focusing on equations in this unit, let's look at the idea of what an equation is. It's a complete mathematical statement where you have an assertion that what you have is true. And you can say an equation can have one of, in a way, the equation itself can have one of two values. It can be true or not true. For example, if I look at the assertion here in this slide, I have 2 plus 3, 5 minus 4 is equal to 1. It turns out that that assertion, the equation itself, is a true statement because, in fact, what I have on the left mathematically reduces to what's on the right. If I had uh, equal to 5 on the right, the equation itself as an assertion would be false. So in a way, you can think of equations as assertions that you can say, yes, that's true, or no, that's false. In the case here, we have a true assertion. Um, in a sense, you can think of an equation being a lot like a sentence. It says something is equal to, that's the equal sign, that's the verb, something else. So if you want to if you're grounded in terms of grammar, you can think of an equation as having a subject, what's on the left, a verb, which is the equation sign is equal to, and an object, whatever is on the right. But as I said, it's a statement of mathematical truth as far as we're concerned. And the equal sign is, is. It's the assertment, it's the assertment of truth. This is this. Another basic concept that we've been using all along whenever we've talked about equations in math is that the equation is like a balance. The pivot point is like the equal sign, and what you have on one side of the equation, if you have an equal, balances with what's on the other side of the equation. Let's look at this absolutely literally. I have a balance here I'd like to show you and play with it a little bit. 
This is a balance that I found for sale at a market in Guatemala a long time ago. It's quite primitive. It's basically just a stick with uh, a string through it. And I actually um, put a little paper clip here so that when it's empty, it actually balances. So here's this whole thing is like my equal sign. Here I have a set of nested weights I bought at the same market. Uh, all together, I think there's about a pound, and they're pretty. They're interesting because they're all hand carved from brass. And what we can see here is that if these quantities are equivalent, I put these in here, these in here, and raise this thing. And you see, if I get the thing to stop rotating and wiggling, they actually balance. So I can say the weight here is equal to, I can think of the balance as the pivot point, the weight here. If I remove one of the weights, you see what's going to happen, I no longer here have a balance. And so, in other words, this is not an equality. On the other hand, if I do this, I have an equality. So think of when you see an equation, think of that equation as this kind of a balance. And your statement is mathematically true when this balance holds, if you see an equal sign right here. We'll be back and take another look at this in a few minutes. Again, the equal sign is like that pivot point on that very primitive balance. Now let's take a look at some of the vocabulary dealing with equations. And again, this is review. You probably know this. I hope you do anyway. When you have x, y, z letters in an equation, that's a variable. You don't know what that is. And the whole point of writing something like this is given the fact that we have the equation there, that we have the equal sign there, and we've made the assertion that what's on the left must be equal to what's on the right, we'll fo we want to force that to be true. Let's continue looking at the um, vocabulary. The variable is also called the unknown because it's what you want to get. When we have numbers, those numbers are called constants. Those are things that don't change. And the whole crux of being able to solve an equation is the fact that we have an equal sign and we want to make sure that we do things that make that mathematical truth continue to hold. To solve an equation means to find some value of x so that when you find a value of x, x equals, you can say x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, or whatever, when you find that value of x, you put it in there and it makes that statement true when you substitute whatever your solution is for x and then do the math what you will ultimately wind up with is 2 equals 2, mathematically true statement. And when you get that, you'll know that your solution of the equation is correct because you've maintained the integrity of that equal sign mathematically. The solution of an equation is the value, and it could be several values. We'll see a case where that's true, uh, such that the equation is true, the equation holds. How do we find solutions to equations? Various ways. The point is we need to find the missing terms. Here, for example, is an, is a, an equation with something added in addition to the unknown. And we need to find out how to get the unknown all by itself. Here is something where we have a constant multiplied by the, by the unknown. 
in order to solve that, we need to uh, do some operation that gets the x, the unknown, by itself. We may have any, um, the unknown squared, or we may have the square root of the unknown. Again, we need to find a procedure that lets us get the x just by itself. Let's look at the most basic, most primitive procedure. Let's talk about the trial and error method, the guesstimate method. And you look at the equation and you say, yeah, let's try a 3, let's try a 4, let's see what happens. And then you try something, well, we'll, we'll take a look. Here's the procedure. Make a wild guess as to what the value is, well, maybe not so wild. Perhaps you could think about it a little bit and then, well, maybe this number ought to be pretty small. So let me try a small number because if I guess 3,000, I'll get 50 million over here is equal to 5. That's not going to work. So that there are ways of dealing with reasonable guesses and then working your way closer and closer. Then you substitute the value for the variable and check to see if what you have on the left is equal to what you have on the right. For example, here we're given x plus 3 equals 5. And you ask yourself, what number, when I add it to 3, will give me a 5? Uh, that's a pretty rough one. Let's take a wild guess here. What about 2? Let's try a 2. Sure enough, 2 plus 3 is 5, and when I substitute the 2 in for x, I get 5 equals 5. Therefore, I can say that 2 is a solution to this equation because when I substitute the 2 in for the x, I get a mathematical identity. 5 is equal to 5. Wow, I'm done. It all works. And my intuition, what I knew about mathematics, maybe even counting on my fingers, gave me the solution to this. Let's guess another one that might be a little bit more complicated. How about this? x squared plus 1 is equal to 50. Let's think for a minute. What number when I square it is awfully close to 50? Again, I'm just guessing this is a trial and error method. How about 7? Because I know that 7, plus, seven times 7 is 49. Let's try that. 7 squared plus 1 is equal to 50. 49 plus 1 is equal to 50. It's looking more and more like this guess is going to be a pretty good one. And sure enough, 50, of course, is equal to 50 when I add the 49 and 1. So 7 is a solution to that equation because if I put in 7 squared plus 1, you see that I get 50. So my guess worked pretty well. It turns out that because I have a square term there, 7 is not the only number that is going to be a solution. Want to take another guess at what number I'm going to find that will also be a solution. Let's try minus 7. Remember, when you have a minus times a minus, you get a plus. So if I substitute in minus 7 or negative 7 and square it, I find that it also will give me 50 equals 50 ultimately. So I have to say that minus 7 is also a solution to this equation. So here's a case where I have an equation and there are two possible solutions. Often, equations like this occur in physics, for example, and in particular, when you look at the path of objects under the influence of gravity, you wind up with equations like this. And you want to ask yourself, you know, and these equations have two solutions. For example, the equation dealing with motion and time has the time as a square power. And often you'll get a value for time, which is, say, plus 3 seconds and minus 3 seconds. Only one of them makes any physical sense because if I start, if I shoot something, 
minus three seconds doesn't mean anything to my problem, and I use the positive solution because time runs forward. So in science, where you have multiple solutions crop up, often only one of the solutions makes any sense in the particular physical application. Let's move along and look at solving equations that we can't do in our head very easily right away. Guessing will work, and in fact, guessing is not a, a bad thing to do. Uh, in, there are when we, uh, there's a lot of techniques that use computers to guess numbers and check, and often very very complex equations in science are use computers that can guess solutions very quickly, look at the result, and then decide whether to raise or lower the solution a little bit, and can come to numerical solutions that are very, very, very close, and it's incredibly complicated. So these days of computers, guessing isn't necessarily a bad thing, but that's beyond the scope of Math 86. We're going to look for techniques that help us to actually solve equations. We need a procedure, and we're going to look at that procedure. There are a lot of different kinds of equations, and we're going to focus in Math 86, in pre-algebra, only on the linear ones. Let's explain what that means. Um, those are equations that have no variables higher than degree 1. That's a linear equation right there because x is to the first power. But there are equations very similar to the one we just looked at. x squared plus 1 is equal to 50. Remember that one? x squared plus 4 is equal to 20. There's an equation where x is raised to the second power, and it's not a linear equation, or we call it nonlinear. And future classes in algebra will deal with this. Let's look at why these are called these things. If you think about, there's an, if you write an equation y with two variables, y is equal to 2x plus 1, and then I put in values for x. For example, what is y when x is equal to 0? Well, when x is equal to 0 on that graph right in the middle, y is minus 1. And I substitute other values for x, and when I do, I see a straight line goes through all of those points relating x and y. On the other hand, when I have something like y equals x squared, when x is 0, y is 0. So I have a point right there. On the other hand, if x is 1 or x is minus 1, y is 1. So I have two possible values of x, two solutions for one value of y and I can continue to substitute, this doesn't look like a straight line. We call this a nonlinear equation. When we do solutions of equations that are other than very, very simple ones, we're going to stick to linear equations. To solve complex problems, we're going to need a procedure that works in every possible case, and I'm back to the balance. Think balance, think the golden rule. Let's go to the desk again and look at that balance that I had from Guatemala in another light. Here's the balance, and under the table I have hidden x, the unknown. I'm going to write, if you'll pardon the expression, I'm going to write an equation with x and then solve it. Here's x, and if I say x is this thing, it looks like it works. On the other hand, if I have that x, um, if I have um, x plus something, I see it doesn't work, and I add something here, and so having the same thing, I have x plus something a little bit more here is equal to whatever is over on this other side of the balance. 
Now, the point of an equation is I want x by itself. So let me just pull this thing, this, this um, extra weight, off of that side. I no longer have a balance. So what I need to do is if I've pulled a particular weight off of here, I pull the same weight off of here, and I've solved this equation for x by getting x by itself on the left and a number on the right. And in a, ver in a weird sense, this, ba this, ba this simple balance scheme can be thought of as an analog computer for solving linear equations because I can mimic everything with a scale physically that I'm doing over there mathematically. Think about that. This is actually a very simple computer for solving equations. I can represent the unknown as the weight and then manipulate it to actually figure out what the value of the weight is. Let's go back and look at some more of the math behind this. So an equation is like a balance. And you can think of the equal sign as a pivot point. If I add a 3 to one side, it's going to upset that balance. So what I need to do is do exactly the same thing to both sides of that equation to restore the balance. We say that we have the golden rule of equations. Do unto one side of an equation that which you've done unto the other. To solve an equation, we need to find a value for x that makes this statement true. How do we do it? We manipulate the terms to get the variable by itself, and I <laughs> say that you do stuff to get x by itself without destroying the equality. And what kind of stuff do you do? Well, you can add to both sides of the equation, subtract things from both sides, multiply, divide things from both sides of the equation, square both sides of the equation, or take the square root of both sides of the equation. So you can do any standard mathematical operation, but you need to be careful to do it to both sides. Here we have x plus 27 equals 50. Um, I need to combine or simplify the terms on the other side of the equation when I'm done so that I have a single number on the right and the variable on the left. Or, of course, since an equal sign doesn't matter what's on what side, I can have the variable on the right and the numbers on the left, but I get a single number, whatever it turns out to be, equal to a single variable on one side or the other of the equation. Let's look at solving an equation. Again, I want to get x by itself. So here I have x plus 4 is equal to 7. If I want, to, I want to take 4 away from the left to get just x plus 4 minus 4, which gives me x by itself because I have two opposites there. They add to 0. So plus 4 minus 4 is 0. But I know it's not 7 because my equation doesn't balance. What I need to do now is to subtract 4 from the right-hand side as well. And I finally get my equation, the uh, solution to my equation, and that gives me x is equal to 3. Now, we can talk about this in a formal way by talking about the principle of addition and subtraction. When we add or subtract the same amount to both sides of the equation, we leave the thing balanced, just like we did in the previous example. Let's start with the equation x equals 5. If we add a 3 to both sides, we have kept the balance. We've retained it because we've done exactly the same thing to both sides of that equation. If we subtract the same amount from both sides of the equation, we again have retained the balance. Remember, we started with x equals 5. So whatever we've done to both sides of that equation retains the balance. We can look at the multiplication division principle of equality, and that's multiplying or dividing both sides of an equation doesn't affect the balance. 
here we have 3n is equal to 12. If I multiply both sides by 5, I've maintained the balance. 15n equals 12 times 5 is 60. I've maintained the balance. If in this case, which is what we really want to do, divide both sides by 3, I've maintained the balance, and I find that if I really wanted to do it, n would be equal to 4. Now, what can we do? Again, we can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and we can also square if we need to, or if we want, we can take the square root of both sides of an equation, and in a way you've seen us do that, because when we were dealing with the x squared plus 1 is equal to 50, we were really trying to solve for x squared equals 49. Taking the square root of both sides of that equation, what have we seen? We've seen that we could have either a plus 7 or a minus 7 is equal to x. We can do all of these mathematical operations to an equation, but we need to remember that as we do this, whatever you've done on the side with the variable, you need to mirror that on the side uh, which has the numbers. And the whole focus of what you want to do is get all the numbers here, and then, if you can, combine the variable over here so that you get a equals whatever, b equals whatever, x, y, z equals whatever. And that's the whole point of what we're doing with equations. That concludes all of the material for Unit A. Let's review what we've done. We've seen how to distinguish between expressions and equations. Remember, equations have the equal sign in them. We've seen how to find solutions to equations by trial and error. You try to make a reasonable guess looking at the equation about what the solution might be. Then you plug it in and try it. We've distinguished between linear and nonlinear equations. Linear equations have the variables only to the first power. We've looked at the concept of the balance as a good model to keep in your head when you're trying to solve equations. And next time, we're going to be starting in Unit B with looking at solving equations with the addition and subtraction principle, and we'll look at that in a very formal way. I'll be back with you in a few minutes with Unit B, Class 6. This is Pre-Algebra, Class 6, Unit B. In Unit A, we looked at the general overall idea of equations and solving equations. And in the, this unit and the succeeding units, we're going to look at specific techniques in quite a bit of depth. In this case, we're going to look at solving equations using the addition-subtraction principle. Let's a preview what's going to happen when, as we work on this lesson and some of the things that you'll be able to do when you've completed all the work in this lesson. You'll be able to use the addition and subtraction principle to solve linear equations. And remember what a linear equation was from last time, an equation where x is only to the first power or whatever other variable you might have, the unknown you'll be able to solve equations with variables on one side of the equal sign, and we'll extend that, and you'll be able to solve equations with variables on both sides of the equal sign. Let's get going with the addition and subtraction principle. First, a little bit of review. Remember, think about a balance as we're solving the equations, and remember the golden rule that we need to do the same thing to both sides of the equations. An equation is like a balance. The equal sign of the equation is like a pivot point, 
and the equation has to balance. You have to have the same thing on either side of the equation. Our golden rule is you need to do the same thing to both sides. Do unto one side that which you would do unto the other. And we apply this to the addition-subtraction principle of equality, which says that if you add or subtract the same amount to both sides of the equation, you don't hurt the mathematical truth of the equation. You still have an equal sign, and that statement of the equation remains a true fact. So adding or subtracting something to both sides keeps that balance going, and we're going to use that idea as a way of getting whatever the unknown is, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, the whole alphabet by itself. Here we go. Suppose we start with this equation. What are we really talking about? Our equation is x equals 5. Very simple. Now, if I add 3 to both sides of that equation, the addition principle says I can do that, and I can be absolutely sure that I've retained the balance, that exactly the, that remains a mathematically correct statement, x plus 3, equals 5 plus 3 remains mathematically true. The same way, if I subtract the same thing, if I start with x equals 5 and then subtract 3 from both sides of that equation, I retain the balance. What I've done is true. And that's what the addition-subtraction principle tells us, that you can add the same thing to both sides of an equation, or you can take the same thing away from both sides of the equation and you haven't affected the equation. Let's look now at using that on some examples. Here's an equation we're going to start with. r plus 13 is equal to minus 22. We'll put r plus 13, that's our unknown is r, remember that's what we want to find, and that's equal to minus 22, so we've set it up on the balance. Now, knowing that we need to keep r by itself, we need to get rid of that 13. So let me subtract 13 from each side of those. Plus 13 minus 13 is 0, so I have r by itself on the left. Then I have minus 22 plus a minus 13 on the right. So r by itself is equal to minus 22 minus 13. Now I can do the math, combine terms on the right. Remember, we want a single number, if at all possible. So when I do the math, I get r is equal to minus 35, and that is the solution to this equation. We can always check the solution, a very, very good idea. And we check the solution by taking the original equation then taking our solution to the equation and sticking it in the variable in the original equation and seeing if, in fact, what we have is the same on both sides of that equal sign. So I ask myself, is minus 35 plus 13 in fact equal to minus 22? And we can, remember, do this as a subtraction on the number line and keep the sign of the larger numbers. Um, 5 minus 3 is 2, 3 minus 1 is 2, so I have a 22 when I do the math. Since there's a negative sign on the 35 and it's bigger, I keep that sign, and I see minus 22 is equal to minus 22. My solution is correct. You should always, particularly when the equation is a little bit complicated and you're not 100% sure, you're absolutely right. It's a great idea to go through this procedure when you're finished to check your equation. Often, you know, you'll find something you've done that might just be a, some little mistake. You added wrong or something, or you subtracted wrong, and so your answer is just a little bit off. You'll never catch it because it looks reasonable and so forth, but if it's off one or two, plugging it in and checking your solution is a very good idea and we're going to encourage you to do that. Now, here we have 
the same amount subtracted from both sides of the equation. If we started out with x equal to 5 and we subtracted 3 from both sides, that retains the balance. Suppose we have an equation now as an example. c minus 27 is equal to 45. We put c minus 27 on one side of the balance, 45 on the other. We want c by itself. How can I do that? If I add 27 to each side of the equation, I have c plus 27 minus 27 equals 45 plus 27. So, doing the math, I get c is equal to 72, um, 45 plus 27, if you do that addition, is going to give me 72. The solution of the equation is equal to c, the unknown, is equal to 72. By requiring that the equal sign and the validity of all of our operations be mathematically correct, we work to what c must be if that equ original equation were a mathematically true statement. Let's check our solution. We start with the original equation and our solution. The answer when we solve the equation, then put the solution back into the original equation and check to see that what we have on the left is exactly what we have on the right. Our solution is correct. We haven't messed up the math. We've done this equation as correctly as we possibly can. So again, keep that idea of the balance in your head. And so we'll use this as a reminder to you, but we're not going to be using that balance idea all the time. It's just something that you should keep in your head, the same as when you're doing um, uh, mathematics with integers, you should keep thinking of the number line and where things are on the number line. When you're doing equations, keep thinking of the balance. It'll help you to know what to do in any particular circumstance. For example, x minus 23 is equal to 45. I'm not going to put the balance there, but what do we need to do to both sides of this equation to get x by itself? Let's add 23 to both sides, which gives me x is equal to 68. That's the solution of the equation. I'm just thinking of the balance. I didn't put it in there. Then let's check to see if we've done this correct. So 68 minus 23 is equal to 45. And if I do the math, 8 minus 3 is 5, 6 minus 2 is 4. Our solution to this equation is the correct one. Let's take another example. P plus 56 is equal to 128. First, keep in mind the balance. What must we do here? Let me subtract 56 from both sides of this equation. When I do the math, I find that P, the unknown, the variable, is equal to 72. Then I check it by putting 72 in place of p and seeing if 72 plus 56 actually adds up to 128. 2 plus 6 is 8, 7 plus 5, 12, and so I know now that my solution is a correct one. Let's look at something that is possibly more annoying. I start with minus 4x plus 5 plus 5x minus 2 is equal to 37. Here I see I have two terms with x in it and two numbers on the left. As the second equation shows you, without changing anything, I can swap them around so now I can find like terms. I can combine the two terms with the x's and I can combine the two numbers. Minus 4x plus 5x is just x. Minus, uh, minus 4 plus 5 gives me plus 1. Then I combine the numbers. 5 minus 2 gives me plus 3. 
So finally, I have the equation. I've taken that fairly messy looking thing and simplified it to x plus 3 is equal to 37. I think about the balance and know that I need to subtract 3 from both sides of that equation. When I do that, I get the solution that x is equal to 34. And of course, I can check if I wanted to. 34, plugging that in for x, plus 3. 4 and 3 is 7. 37 equals 37. So I've done this one correctly. Or, if I wanted to, I could go back to actually the absolutely the original equation where I have minus 4x plus 5 and so forth and it's even better to try plugging into that just to make sure you didn't make a mistake combining those like terms. So I put 34 in wherever I've seen x then I do the math on this simplify a little more and wind up with 37 equals 37 okay I, f I feel that I've done a pretty good job here doing this equation. Let's look at another problem where we have the same kind of thing happening. But remember in unit A I told you that it really doesn't matter what thing is on one side of an equation and what's on another side of an equation. The point is that you want all of the unknowns on either the left or the right and whatever side the unknowns are on, you want the numbers over on the other side. So this is, looks a little different, but the idea is the same because now our variable is going to be on the right side. Doesn't make a bit of difference. Next thing we do is try to simplify this by putting all of the like terms at least together, then doing the arithmetic. 8y minus 7y is y, 4 plus 2 is 6. So here is our equation, 25 is equal to y plus 6. To solve it, I think about the balance, and I subtract 6 from both sides of the equation, leaving me with 19 is equal to y. Or if I want to express this more algebraically, that, what you see there, 19 equals y, perfectly good expression. But normally, the custom is to put the unknown on the left and just state it the other way that y is equal to 19. Of course we want to check this. So I plug 19 in this everywhere there's a y, do the math to simplify it, and I find that when I'm finally done, 25 equals 25, and I feel satisfied that I have done this problem as well as I can, and it's, in fact, correct. We're going to expand what we're doing now. Up to this point, every one of the equations that we've worked with has had variables and some numbers on one side, and then all numbers over on the other side. We're going to use the principle of addition-subtraction in equations now to work with something just a little bit more complex where we have the variables on both sides of the equation. Let's look at a strategy for doing that. We're going to perform operations to get all of the variables on one side, all on the left or all on the right, whichever turns out to be easiest, and as you do them, you'll develop an intuition for which side to get the variables on. And we want all the numbers on the other side. Then once we've done that, we can do whatever other operations are necessary to get the variable one times the variable by itself on one side, all the numbers on the other. Let's look at a specific example. Here's 12 plus 8n equals 7n plus 3. I want all the numbers on one side, all the stuff with n in it on the other side. I look at this a little bit and say, well, what happens if I subtract an n from both sides of that equation? That gets rid of all of the n's on the right and gives me only n's on the left. So just as I was subtracting integers before, 
Now I'm going to be doing the same thing with variables. That leaves me with the equation 8n minus 7n is 1n, 12 plus n equals 3. Now I have another step, though, because I don't have pure variables on the left. I've got to get rid of that 12 on the left. Let me subtract 12 from both sides of that, that equation. And when I do that, I get n by itself on the left, plus 3 minus 12 minus 9. So the solution to this equation is n is equal to minus 9. Of course, we want to check, so we substitute minus 9 in for the places where we had n in the original equation, do the math, and when we do, we find we get minus 60 equals minus 60. That makes me feel good. I've done everything right, and I can give this equation an okie dokie. So here's a hint. It's something that you can look at. You don't have to do it every time, but something I do is that when I move the terms around, I check to see what I'm going to be adding or taking away, but I want the variable positive on one side or the other. Again, you can deal with it negative, but if it's positive, you don't have to take the inverse of each side or the opposite of each side. You can just leave it. Let's see how that might work. So here is 8 minus 3q equal to minus 2q plus 6. So I need to clear the q's away from one side or the other of that equation. Let's see what happens if I add 2q to each side. If I add plus 2q to the right and plus 2q to the left, I'll get the equation that 8 minus q is equal to 6. And I see here that I'm left with a minus q when I ultimately solve this. You can continue to solve the equation like this, but you can save a step just by thinking ahead a tiny bit. Let's redo this, but let's add a 3q to both sides. When I do this, I get an equivalent equation that will lead me to the same result. It has to because I haven't done anything illegal. It gives me 8 is equal to plus q plus 6. So by adding the plus 3 to both sides rather than the minus 2, I've changed the side I leave the q on, but I've left it positive. Makes it just a tiny bit easier to do. My next step is to perform the equation that way. Let's add that so I get 8 equal to q plus 6. The next thing I want to do here is see if you're keeping up with me staying ahead of me, I hope, we subtract a 6 from both sides of the equation that leaves q by itself on the right and, in fact, gives me the solution that 2 is equal to q or more mathematically grammatical, but just as correct, I can say that when I write this on my homework, I would normally put this q is equal to 2 but again, leaving 2 equals q, perfectly okay to do. Now we can check this by putting 2 in for q into the original expression and checking 8 minus 6 is equal to minus 4 plus 6. Sure, 2 is equal to 2, so we've done this equation as correctly as we possibly could. Now, let's look at another problem that you can solve, even if you don't care about the hint. The hint is useful, but let's do this problem the other way, just to see what happens. I have 10 minus 8w is equal to minus 7w plus 3. Now, what I'd like to do here, because my instinct tells me I want all of the variables on the left, get them over on the left. So what do I do here to get them on the left? I will add 7w to each side of those equations. Let's see what I'm left with here. I'm left with a 10 minus w is equal to 3. So you see there the w is negative. 
Now I need to, of course, to get W by itself on one side, subtract 10 from both sides of that equation, and I can see that now I have a minus W equals to minus 7. But if minus W is minus 7, I can multiply both sides of that equation by minus 1. That's one way to think about it. Or I could take the opposite of both sides of the equation, or just change this since they're both negative. I can take the additive inverse of both sides and solve this by saying that w is equal to 7. If minus w is equal to minus 7, multiplying both sides by minus 1, taking the additive inverse of both sides, doing whatever those operations are, if you have negatives on both sides, you can assert this. If minus w is minus 7, then w is equal to 7. Of course, how do we know this? Well, we need to check to see that what we're doing is correct. I put the 7 in for w in both sides of the equation now and do the math. 10 minus 56 equals minus 49 plus 3, and I get minus 46 equals minus 46. And I said, yes, I have done this equation correctly. Let's review. The two prime rules for solving equations are this. Get the variable by itself. That's your strategy. And to be mathematically correct, you need to do the same thing to each side of the equation. Let's look at a few more problems and even get a little bit more complex. Here I see I have parentheses on both sides of the equation. I have 2 times the quantity z plus 3 on the left, and I have minus 2 times the quantity minus 2z minus 4 on the right. I need to simplify both sides of that equation, and I need to use the distributive principle to get rid of those parentheses. Let me do that. And of course, I always need to remember to do the, the, the same thing to both sides. To get rid of the parentheses on the left, I need to multiply each the z and the 3 by that 2. So I have 4z that I had outside, plus 2 times z is 2z, 2 times 3 is 6, so I have 4z plus 2z plus 6 on the left. I do the same thing on the right. I have the z that's already there. Minus 2, minus 2z, minus times minus is a plus. Uh, 2 times 2 is 4, so I get 4z. Minus 2 times minus 4 is plus 8. So the first thing I've done is gotten rid of those parentheses. Now I need to simplify by collecting like terms. I have 4z plus 2z on the left. I get 6z plus 6z plus 4z. 1z plus 4z is 5z. Now I'm ready to go. I have my equation simplified as much as possible. Now I need to start using the addition or subtraction principle to find what z by itself is. Let me subtract 5z from both sides of that equation, and I'm left with z plus 6 is equal to 8. Need to go to a new slide, I'm running out of room here, but we'll continue. z plus 6 equals 8. What I need to do now is subtract a 6 from both sides of the equation and finally get that z is equal to 2. Next, I need to check. So there's my original equation, and I substitute a 2 wherever I had a z in the original expression, and I work out the math. Uh, 4 times 2 is 8. Uh, 2 plus 3 is 5 times 2 is 10, and that equals what you see on the right there. When I do the math, I find that 18 is equal to 18, and OK, I've done this equation correctly. Very good. Good for me. Let's look at another one. 
And again, we have to use the distributive rule to get rid of the brackets. I have 3 times the quantity w plus 1 plus 2 is equal to 2 times the quantity w minus 2 plus 3. So the first thing we need to do is multiply w by 3 and the 1 by 3, giving me 3w plus 3 plus 2. Doing the same thing on the right, 2 times w is 2w, two, 2 times minus 2 is minus 4. Now I simplify that one more time, and I look at it, and now I start having to use the addition-subtraction principle. Let me take a 2w from each side of that equation. That leaves me with w plus 5 is equal to minus 1, subtracting 5 from both sides of that equation leaves me with w equals minus 6. Of course, we want to check the equation. We do this, as you see, and I've left all the math here for you to see. We do this by putting in minus 6 where we have a w, working down, doing the math step by step, until on both sides of the equation we have minus 13 equals minus 13, and we can say, OK, we have done this equation correctly. That pretty much does it for unit B. Let's review a little bit and see what we've covered in this unit. First, we've seen that you can add or subtract equal things from either side of an equation to ultimately solve the equation, and by adding or subtracting the same thing to both sides, you don't change the fact that it's still an equation. We've seen how to solve equations with variables only on one side. You subtract the numbers or add the numbers to both sides until the equation is by itself. And we've seen how to solve linear equations with variables on both sides. You first add or subtract a variable on one side until you have the equation, the variable by itself on one side, then you do the same thing with the numbers, and ultimately you have a variable equals a number. That concludes the review, and we'll be back in a short time with talking about the division multiplication principle for solving equations. This is pre-algebra class 6, unit C. In unit B, we looked at solving equations using the addition and subtraction principle. We're going to extend what we know in this unit, and what we'll do, to multiplication and division, then look at a combination, and then look at translating word problems. Let's um, see what you'll be able to do when you finish all the work associated with this unit you'll be able to solve linear equations using the multiplication division principle. You'll be able to solve linear equations using a combination of the two principles, addition, subtraction, and multiplication division. You'll be able to translate sentences describing mathematical relationships to equations. Let's get started. Let's look now at the multiplication and division principle. We've already used this a bit, so this in a way will be a review for you. We see that in addition to having terms added and subtracted to your unknown, you can also have your unknowns multiplied or divided. For example, we could have 4 times the unknown r is equal to 8, or a more complex case, 3 times the unknown n divided by 5 is equal to 15. We're going to see the kinds of things you can do to be able to solve equations that are like this. Let's talk about the multiplication division principle of equality. And basically what it says is if you divide 
or multiply something on the same thing on either side of an equation, you still have an equation when you're done. You're not affecting the mathematical integrity uh, by that operation. For example, here we have 3 times x balancing 12 is equal to 12. If I multiply the 3x by a 5 and the 12 by a 5, I still have an equation when I'm finished with this operation. Similarly, if I have 3x equals 12, if I divide one side by 3 and divide the other side by 3, I can be sure that when I'm done with this operation, that equation sign is still going to be valid. I can still be certain that I haven't violated any mathematical rule and have the same things on both sides. So if the equation had a value of true, if that equation was true when I started, it will also be true when I'm done and, of course, have done all the math right. You always have to be careful about that. Remember now, um, by way of review, there are two things we need to think about when we're solving equations. One is we need to do whatever is mathematically appropriate to get the variable by itself. And while we're in the process of getting that variable by itself, we need to always remember to do the same thing to both sides of the equation. Let's look at an equation. Here is 3 times the unknown n is equal to 12. What must we do to solve this equation? Right. We divide the left-hand side by a 3 because 3 divided by 3 gives me 1n. And if I do it to the left, I also need to do it to the right. What I wind up with now is 3 times the quantity n divided by 3 is equal to 12 divided by 3. I can be very certain that's correct. n divided by th 3n divided by 3 is 1n. 12 divided by 3 is equal to 4. 1n is the same as n, so my solution is n is equal to 4. And of course, we can check ourselves by substituting 4 in for n. So 3n is equal to 12. 3 times 4 is equal to 12. And I have done this incredibly difficult problem. And I can say, wow, good job, Dan. Let's look at another one that might be a tiny bit more annoying, but not too much. Because now we have to use both principles together. You see, we have constants added to the variable terms. 8r plus 7 is equal to 4r plus 15. Again, we, the first thing we need to do are those operations which get all of the numbers on one side and any kind of expression involving variables on the other side. So as I look at this, it seems to me that the most logical thing I can do to get the variables on one side and the numbers on the other would be to subtract 7 from each side of that equation. When I do, 7 minus 7 is 0, and I'm left with 8r by itself on the left equal to 4r plus 8. Let's go to a new slide and continue working on this problem. The next thing I need to do to get the r's by itself, see if you can follow with me and stay a step ahead, is I subtract 4 from each side of the equation. When I do that, uh, 4r minus 4r goes to 0, gives me 0. And on the left, I have 8r minus 4r. That's 4r equals 8. Still not done because I want 1r, not 4 of them. So what I have to do, follow along with me, what do I have to do? Divide both sides of that equation by 4. When I do, I get 1r on the left, 4 divided by 4 is 1, is equal to 8 divided by 4, or 2 on the left. 
my solution is r equals 2. And of course, I'd like to check this, and I do it by substituting the 2 in for r on both sides of the equation. 8 times 2 is 16, plus 7 is 23. 4 times 2, which I've substituted in for r on the right, is 8, plus 15 is 23. 23, amazingly enough, equals 23. So I can be sure that I've done that equation correctly. Here we go. Here's another example, again, getting more and more and more complex, apparently. But what you need to remember is that you're not going to be able to solve very much math beyond simple arithmetic problems in your head. All of these things are multi-step problems, and you need to work them out exactly as I've been doing in this class, a little bit at a time. And as I've been doing here, even though I'm using all this electronic stuff, you can do the same thing on a piece of paper, and you need to do it step by step by step. If we look back at the slide now, you see what I have is something that looks incredibly complicated on the face of it, but if I attack it a little at a time, it will resolve itself into something quite doable. So in this case, I have 6 plus the quantity 3 times the quantity z minus 2 plus 6z is equal to twice the quantity 3z minus 8 plus 22. What I need to do first is get rid of those things I've called the quantity, that stuff inside those brackets. And to do it, I need to use the distributive rule. 3 multiplies both the z and the minus 2 on the left. 2 multiplies the 3z and minus 8 on the right. Let's do that operation. I have the 6, then 3 times z is 3z, 3 times minus 2 is minus 6, then I have the 6z that was just sitting there. Doing the di distributive rule on the right, uh, 2 times 3z is 6z, 2 times minus 8 is minus 16, then I still have the 22. Now let's clean up a little bit more. I want to keep simplifying. I see I have z's and numbers on the left. Let me put the z's together and the numbers together, and let me simplify plus 22 minus 16 that I have on the right, and I'm left with this. Continuing our simplification, 3z plus 6z, 9z, and plus 6 minus 6 is 0. So I've simplified the equation from that fairly complex looking thing up on the top to 9z equals 6z plus 6. Now remember my next strategy is to get z's by itself on one side or the other. Let's do this. Let's get all the z's on the left by subtracting a minus 6z from both sides of this equation. Having done this, I see I have 3 times z is equal to 6, and I'm one step away from finishing. In order to get z by itself, since I have z multiplied by 3, I need to divide the 3z by 3, but if I do it on the left, I must also do it on the right. And I wind up with the solution to the equation that z is equal to 2. Before I can go on, of course, I would like to check to see if my